Good morning. Good morning. So what are you going to share with the audience? Could uh, you, you know, reveal a little bit? You got it. <laughs> We're going to talk about inclusive leadership as a skill set that requires us to see in 3D. See in 3D. See in 3D. Now you got me. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Excellent, excellent. It is an honor to be here with you. I am very, very excited. Um, I'm excited to follow our previous speakers um, because as we talk about bringing on all of these people, then the question becomes, what, is the, what are the skills that is important for the leader to have to maximize the benefits of the growth, right? And so we're going to talk about this idea of becoming an inclusive leadership. Now, let me say, when I was in Thailand studying to be uh, a Buddhist monk, and I had the opportunity to be um, in the monastery for about two months, um, I got a nickname. And um, as I would be out in the night markets before I got ordained, I was called uh, Tutai. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why are they calling me Tutai? And then my Thai host looks at me and she says, Stephen, because you're the size of two Thai men. <laughs> and I said, that's not right. <laughs> that is just not right. So I started working out when I got back to the States. And, um, but this idea of inclusive leadership and seeing in 3D. How many of you have been to a 3D movie? How many of you at some point in time in a 3D movie, you take off your 3D pair of glasses? How many people? Yes, because you're thinking, I know I can see those dynamics, but you can't, right? And then you have to put the 3D pair of glasses back on so that you can see more of the dynamics that are happening, right? That 3D pair of glasses is similar to the idea of the third dimension is seeing in the lens of diversity and differences. Now, somebody told me once, they said, 90% of who I am you cannot see. Yet we make 90% of our judgments based on the 10% that we do see. You see, we meet people every day as we travel around the world, and they say to us, they say, Stephen, I don't have a prejudice bone in my body. I treat everybody the same. I don't see differences. And then we watch them. <laughs> and we watch how they tell people hello. Right? They'll walk up to you, and they'll say, how are you? Very nice to meet you. They'll walk up to you, and they'll say, how are you? Nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. They'll walk up to you and they'll say, hello. <laughs> How are you? Right? We say hello to men and we sing to women. <laughs> How many women in the room have gotten that flimsy handshake? Yes. yes. And you're like, let my hand go. <laughs> but this person doesn't see differences. Right? People not only believe that differences don't make a difference in the way they hire, in the way that they promote, in the way that they develop. And then we watch them. And then walk up to people and say, how are you? Nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. They'll walk up to me and they'll say, what's up, dog? <laughs> <laughs> or just the other day, work with me here. It was all this. And you're watching the person going like, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened is we have this supercomputer between our ears called our brains. And that supercomputer processes 11 million bits of data per second. And we have the ability to consciously process 40 bits. Do the math. That means most of what's going on between your ears and mine are happening outside of our awareness. And the brain's job is to keep us safe. So part of how it manages those 11 million bits is that our brains will pull files from the past to make sense of the present. You've experienced this. How many of you have met someone who reminded you of someone you did not like in the past? How did that impact the way you dealt with the new person? Yeah, not so much. You're looking at the new person going, I've seen you before. <laughs> it didn't go so well last time we met. You see, to the brain, similarity equals safety. To the brain, difference equals potential threat. And that difference can make a world a difference. 
to the brain, and this is happening for with, you know, to good people who are working to be bias-free. Inclusive leaders pay attention to patterns of unconscious biases in their actions and in their decisions. I was doing a workshop once, this guy shows up early, and he says to me, he says, Dr. Jones, I came early because I want you to know that I don't have any unconscious biases. <laughs> I'm like, dude, how would you know they're unconscious? <laughs> you see, we think about this work around inclusive leadership as a skill set. Somebody t- told me diversity is about counting heads. Inclusion is about making heads count. You can have diversity and not have inclusion. You can have inclusion and not have diversity. Tell me what you see. A face. How many people see a face? What else do you see? Some people are going, did somebody just call me a liar? <laughs> How many of you see the word liar? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now you do. Check with the person next to you to make sure they see both. <laughs> now, let me say real quickly, real quickly, that there is a psychological profile if you saw the word liar first. Please stay after class. We need to talk. (laughs) Can you find 10 faces? Can you find 10 faces? (laughs) The horse's faces don't count. How many people see at least three faces? How many people see at least five faces? How many people see seven faces? Nine faces? Anyone see 10 faces? Anyone see more than 10 faces? (laughs) Please stay after class, we need to talk. All right, work with one or two people next to you to see all 10 faces, go for it. Work with one or two people to see all 10 faces. All right, for the sake of time, let's see how your teams have done. All right, let's look at it here. Everybody see this face? Eye, eye, nose, mouth. Number two is right next to it, right here. Eye, eye, nose, mouth. Number three is a big one. Everybody see this one? Here's the eye, the bridge of the nose, the mouth, the chin. It's a big one right here. Everybody seeing that one now? No, not quite. Okay. Here's the eye, the bridge of the nose, upper, mu- upper lip, lower lip, chin. Right here. Big one. Number four is right next to it. Eye, eye, nose, mouth. Number five is right above it. Eye, nose, mouth. Number six is tucked right in here. Everybody see this one? Eye, eye, nose, mouth. Coming down the river, number seven. Right next to it, eye, nose, mouth. Number eight is right next to it. Eye, eye, nose, mouth. Number nine is over here. Number ten is a big one. Here's the eye, the nose, the mouth. Number eleven is right next to it. Eye, nose, mouth. Number twelve is right here. And number 13 is a little one right in here. Right in here. Now, turn to someone next to you and talk to them about how this slide and this activity speaks to the importance of inclusive leadership 
as a way to leverage diversity for greater productivity. Turn to someone next to you. Talk about it. Go. How does this activity, finding these 10 faces, Let's talk about it. I want to hear from three people. What did you and your partner talk about? How does this activity and uh, these slides represent the importance of inclusive leadership as a strategy for greater productivity? Three people. Yes. Well, actually, when you work together with somebody else, you see more than when you work on your own. Absolutely. If you work together with someone else, you're able to see more than you work on your own. And it was great watching you all. You were leaning in. Some of you told your partner, it's right here. <laughs> and then others of you said, if you turn your head this way, you'll see it. <laughs> right? Two more people. Looking at things from a different perspective. That when we're open to seeing different viewpoints and different perspectives, we can see more. Right? One more person. Yes. One more time. Being non-defensive. Non-judgmental too. Yes. <laughs> right? Non-defensive and non-judgmental. Yes. So it's the idea of if we're looking at the same thing and you see something that I don't, if I feel like you're going to judge me, then I'm less likely to tell you my viewpoint. And if you're not willing to do the work to see what I see, and instead, because you can't see it, you think that I'm lying. Right? And so this idea is really to say, we say, if agreement is the currency for inclusion, we're in trouble. If agreement is the currency for inclusion, innovation is in trouble. Now, we got a call to do some executive coaching with a senior manager. He was getting a vote of no confidence from his team. They asked if we would coach him. We said yes. But we wanted to speak with his direct reports first. We spoke with them, and they said, well, he tells you that he's open to your ideas, but we can tell when he's not. And we're like, how can you tell when he's not open to your ideas? They said, when he disagrees with you, he listens to you like this. Do you know when we gave him that feedback, he had no idea that's what he did? No idea. Right? We have to pay attention to the ways that we respond to differences. Because that supercomputer, those 11 million bits, are at play. I'll give you an example of this. In a second, I'm going to ask you to answer a question for me out loud together, everyone in one voice. You ready? No, no, no. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. What color is this sheet of paper? A little bit louder. What color is this sheet of paper? White. Come on, you. What color is this sheet of paper? White. What do cows drink? Yeah. <laughs> ah, very good. There are some of you who are like, I know this one. <laughs> There's a, there were others of you like, I know this one. Milk. <laughs> and then there were others of you who said very confidently, milk. I've been in the industry for 25 years. Milk. <laughs> And there's someone in here who's going, I don't get it. What's the problem? <laughs> Why did you say milk? Because it's white. You associate. You have a thought drink. You see a symbol cow. Your next thought is milk. It does your body good. Pass it on. We have to pay attention to this because oftentimes when we're doing that hyper growth, Right? And people come into the company. Sometimes their experience is, welcome to Company X. I just want to let you know here, we see six faces. We've seen six faces for the last 50 years. <laughs> it's the Company X way. 
Six faces. How many faces? Six. You'll do well here. Very good. <laughs> high performer. Yes, high performer right here. Right? We have to watch out for this. Why? Because there is research that shows that when you compare a group that is homogeneous compared to a group that is diverse, in the short term, the group that is homogeneous' performance will, out, will exceed the performance of the group that's more diverse. What do you think is causing the lift in performance of the group that is more similar to each other in the beginning? Two people. What do you think? Less learning curve. One more person. More trust that gets established equally up in the back. It's easier to agree, right? They see six faces, you see six faces, I see six faces, let's go. That strength over the midterm and the long term creates groupthink and causes the group's performance to plateau. The group that is more diverse takes longer to build trust. We use the same words and may mean different things. We have different cultural backgrounds. We have different norms. Somebody told me once common sense is more cultural sense than it is common sense. We were doing some work in London and we were working with the team and they said, we do, we were doing really good. And then we started seeing people from Poland coming in. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then we're like, they just think different. And I was like, you're kidding me, right? They're like, no. Right? These differences come into play. And then people start to say who we were in uh, Singapore doing work. And people said, you know, there's a Singapore Malay. Then there's Singapore Thai. Then there's Singapore Chinese. Are y'all with me? And people were kind of going, well, wait a minute. People are leaning towards people that are more similar to them. Here's the skill. In the face of difference, practice curiosity. Because oftentimes the similar to me bias gets hidden in the conversation around cultural fit. How many of you heard someone use that word, fit? When was the last time you heard someone say, they are so different from us, they will be a great fit? <laughs> no. Unless we are very intentional, oftentimes fit means they are more similar to us. And I'm not just talking about the 10%. I'm talking about I'm an introvert, they're an introvert. Fit. I avoid conflict, they avoid conflict. Fit. <laughs> I heard a manager who said, look, I don't know about this fit stuff. I just don't want to hire a headache. <laughs> I said, you mean someone who's going to think different than, differently than you? He says, no, a headache. <laughs> we have to be open to people who look at the same thing and see things differently. Because when the group hits a pivotal point, right, the performance of the diverse group will outperform the performance of the homogeneous group. But there are two conditions that make this shift happen. One is when the leader, when the group has an inclusive leader who knows how to create the conditions for diversity of thought to thrive. We were coaching another manager. We shadowed him for a couple days. We saw a pattern in the way that he responded in meetings. When people said something he agreed with, he would say, that's a great point. He would build on what they said. When people said something he disagreed with, he would say, next person. What do you think people started doing with their ideas? Copying his, holding on to them. The ideas that they started giving were the ideas that they thought he would agree with. And they started relying on the meeting after the meeting. Y'all know those meetings? Where you're in the first meeting and you're nodding your head like you're paying attention? Hmm. Some of you have mastered the timely head tilt. Hmm. And inside you're thinking that idea will never work. But you don't say anything. You wait till the meeting's over, and you find those two or three people that you trust, and you hold the real meeting, where you would have said what you could have said if you felt 
safe enough to say. You see, part of the role of an inclusive leader is to have a practice a leadership style that embraces and encourages and taps into the creativity and the ideas that come about from diverse groups. It's an idea of stepping towards difference. It's the idea of practicing a skill that we call two and two. Here's the skill. Before you're about to make a final decision that on a project, a process, a program, an idea, a policy, that you pause and ask yourself individually or collectively, what are two reasons why people might agree with this decision? What are two reasons why people might disagree or resist this decision? You see, those two and two questions provide structure which creates psychological safety for diversity of thought to be presented. That person who was holding on, everybody else was agreeing, and they're thinking, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> and when you ask why might people disagree, depending on the level of safety and trust, they might say something like, I have a friend who might disagree for this reason. If everyone is disagreeing, and the, there's a person in the room who's saying, I'm not sure that I disagree. I can see the rationale, the perspective. That question provides safety for them to say, I could see why people might agree with this decision. Right? So putting that structure in place allows and puts the, the practice of encouraging and tapping into diversity of thought so we can see more than 10 faces. As a matter of fact, Google, in uh, a study that they did called Project Aristotle, where they wanted to understand what made their high-performing teams different than the rest. They thought it was going to be who was on the team, whether people socialized together outside of work, whether they had similar personalities. That's not what they found. What they found instead was, by a 51% contributing factor, they found that the level of psychological safety among the team members, the levels of non-judgmental listening, had a huge impact in differentiating them high-performing teams from the rest. That is a key part. Inclusive leaders make it easy. Here's a, ch a challenge for you. When you get back to the office, I'm going to ask you to find two people that you trust and ask them this question. What is the perceived risk of disagreeing with you respectfully in public? That's one of the ways that you measure the level of inclusion, right? Is the, if the perceived risk is high, inclusion is low. And notice the focus is on respectfully in a meeting. Right? If the perceived risk is low, inclusion, high. Right? And so this idea of when a diverse group is managed well, its performance exceeds similar groups that are more similar. When the per group is not managed well, the performance of the diverse group can tank, <laughs> and it can tank royally. So this is not diversity automatically equals inclusion. It's that we have to work to intentionally leverage diversity of thought. Diversity of thought is informed by diversity of experiences. Diversity of experience enhanced by diversity of background. Diversity of background is fueled by diversity of thought. And it's when you have diverse people bringing their diverse thoughts in an inclusive environment, that's where you get higher performance. Now, here's one of the challenges. One of the challenges is this idea of the invisibility of unconscious bias. It's this idea of the invisibility of privilege. I want to give you an example of this. Privilege. Let me ask you, are there any left-handed people in the room? A couple of left-handed people. Okay. I'll ask all of you, do we live in a right-handed world or a left-handed world? Right-handed. Right-handed. What are some things that tell you we live in a right-handed world? Scissors are set up for right-handed people. The pens at the bank are set up for right-handed people. What was that? The cars. The way I, the guitar, oh, guitars, guitars, and cars, <laughs> right? Uh, we pledge with our right hands, we shake with our right hand, place settings are set up for right-handed people. Coffee mugs, a right-handed person picks it up, there's a picture. Left-handed person, no picture. <laughs> it's deep, y'all, it's real, real deep. 
Now, how many of us people wake up, us right-handed people, wake up in the morning like this? My people rule. Power to the right-handed people. The world is ours. How many of us wake up like this? There's usually one. There's usually one in every group. It's okay. And how many of us right-handed people, if the left-handed people started complaining, saying, I'm being discriminated against, how many of us would be like, shut up? <laughs> there is not a problem if you don't create one. Right? Because I'm having a right-handed experience. The dynamic is this. When I'm a part of a group that's in the majority, then your group's way of doing things gets built into the institution, made invisible, and just called normal. And I don't think about myself as a member of a group. I'll say that again. When I'm having a right-handed experience, then the idea is my group's culture, my group's norm, right? My group's ways of doing things gets built into the institution, made invisible, and just called normal. Like, I don't wake up in the morning and think to myself, I'm going to be a good heterosexual today. I wonder if I'm going to have to come out. You know, let some people know I'm heterosexual. I wonder if they're going to want me to teach their kids, live in their neighborhoods. Right? I was talking about this once, and an openly gay man in the workshop, he looks at me and he goes, yeah, Stephen, because there are some flaming heterosexuals out there. <laughs> I said, flaming? He goes, yes, y'all come out all the time. I'm like, what do you mean we come out all the time? He says, well, when you talk about your family that's coming out, if you have a picture of your family in your workspace that's coming out, during holiday parties, if you bring your partner, that's coming out. He said, do you know what would happen to me if I spoke as openly and freely about my significant other as you do about yours? At the time, I said to him, dude, I never thought about that. He says, that's part of your privilege. You don't have to. Are y'all with me? It's the idea that when I'm a part of a group that's in the majority, then I feel included so I don't have to think about inclusion. When I am outside of that majority, then we may be standing, we may be walking on the same sidewalks every day, and I may be having a very different experience than you are. And that's part of the skill, is to say, how do we work to see in 3D? How do we pay attention to some of the dynamics and stay open to hearing that we may be looking at the same thing, living in the same organization? and maybe having very different experiences. Very important because we say, if you have a brain, you have bias. Unconscious bias. Our goal as inclusive leaders is to manage our brains in action. Thank you all. Thank you.